It's that magical time of year, everyone. It's fishing expo season. Fishing DMV and Jake's Bait and Tackle are going to be live from the Richmond Fishing Expo. The Richmond Fishing Expo starts Friday, January 19th, and it runs through Sunday, January 21st. Fishing the DMV is going to be booth 103. As always, we're going to be giving you the best coverage of this expo possible, going booth to booth with a live stream, having in really good conversations with some of the legends in our area. Also, Jake's Bait and Tackle has a booth this year as well. They're going to be booth 104, and they're bringing a couple of heavy hitters, bent rod fishing, dead drift, and CT custom center baits. If you're going to be coming down to the Richmond Expo, come on and step, say hi to us. That is booth 103 and booth 104. And if you can't make it, don't worry, because Fishing the DMV is going to bring you tons of coverage. See you there. 33. Fishing the DMV has big plans for the future, but to get there, I need your help. In order to keep the show going through 2024 and beyond, we need a hundred Patreon subscribers. We are only 33 Patreon subscribers away from hitting this first major milestone on Patreon. For $6 a month, which is less than a pack of Senkos or a jackhammer chatterbait, you'll receive a special monthly discount off all of your orders to Jake's Bait and Tackle, whether in-store or online. You'll be entered in weekly prize giveaways only for our Patreon members. You'll have access to members-only content and access to a private Facebook group community. And on top of that, you'll have the satisfaction of knowing that you're the reason this show continues. If you feel like you could donate, I would really appreciate it. Link in the episode description down below. Thank you so much. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to Fishing the DMV. I'm your host, Thomas Ahrens. And today we're going back up to a, a really a fan favorite and what people have been talking about a lot because no one heard of this. Like everyone, when people think of Pennsylvania, they think of really maybe Lake Erie, the Susquehanna, of course. But there's a lake there that people only whisper about and not talk about, which is Raystown. Um, and it's a really cool lake that we're going to delve into a little bit more here. And also some controversy that... Uh, if you live on any lake on the East Coast, maybe that's run by the Army Corps of Engineers, you might want to take notice of this story. Uh, and I'm, I'm joined by Ashley Shope. He runs the uh, Raystown Elite Series events that are on there. Thank you so much for joining me. Well, thank you for having me, Thomas. So uh, we got hooked up really through Facebook um, and some of the controversy that we're going to get into a little bit later on. It's been a whirlwind for you. So before we get into the yucky stuff, I really want to do more of a hype session for why, because I don't think a lot of people outside maybe your your niche and, and maybe mine know about this place. But for people that don't know, where is Racetown? What is it? How big is it? So Racetown is situated um, next to a small town called Huntingdon. It's about 30 miles south of Penn State. Um, it's almost right in the middle of the, of the Keystone State on a map. You'll see like it looks like a, a big swollen river. Um, and that's that's what Racetown started out as. It was an impoundment and they um, had some bad flooding. So they uh, re flooded it, build, built the dam higher. And I want to say 1972. Wow. And so now you have like the old dam is still there. The old dam house is still there. You have a lot of structures underwater. They moved homes. There's trees, there's roads. Um, so all of that is, is still down there from 1972. It's a, it's a pretty big reservoir. And, and then again, so you said it's about 3000 acres, a little bit more, a little it, bit less. It's, uh, 8,300 acres. 8,300 okay. acres. Okay. It's about 30 miles long. It's, it gets, uh, more like riverine towards the upper end where the, where the water comes in. And if I'm not mistaken, it's one of the larger, reservoirs in Pennsylvania that you can run a, a gas motor, correct? I believe it's the largest lake within the state lines. Wow. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, it's on par with like Wallen Pulpack and some of those on the Northern uh, border there. And then how does the, how did you get involved and be running like the, the Racetown elite series? How long have you been doing that for? So I think we're running, um, five years strong now. Um, it was, it started out as a fishing for five by a guy that's fishing in the MLF tour now. Um, obviously he got too busy to run it. And, um, so we took it over about five years ago. Uh, you know, and then COVID came about, that was our first year. So we weren't able to run <laughs> normally. We, we just held opens. Um, it is a single person tournament. Um, we, 
draw. I think last spring our highest draw was 70 boots. Um, That's not bad. We, we do get some guys that have fished uh, big time tours, guys that have held big checks above their head. I don't want to call them out, but uh, we see Mike Iconelli every now and then during some of the opens up here. We see uh, Frank Skalish and his boat. He's always out here uh, and a couple others. If I could ask, why why is it there's tons of tournaments all over the place, but a lot of these pros choose to hop in at Raystown. Is it because there's something special there, particularly? So, uh, like we were speaking about before, um, we had an open in December. It took uh, four fish for almost 23 pounds, and they were all smallmouth. Um, Holy shit! <laughs> it, it was taking uh, 20 pounds to get in the top 10, and and that's with a four fish limit. So. There's a potential here to crack almost a 30 pound bag of all smallmouth um, or add to it. I've seen some eight pound largemouth. We have some freshwater striper, which kind of gets the headlines. We have the state record striper from, from this lake. Um, so th there's a lot of diverse uh, fisheries within, within the lake. How did the smallmouth fishing get so good? And, and honestly, let me get a better question. How the hell has no one heard of this place before? Because there's not, when I was researching before the show, it's not like a wealth of knowledge on this place. I would think, well, I might get in trouble for, you know, telling you what I know. <laughs> <laughs> but a lot of guys just don't want um, people to know about it. They want to keep it to themselves. Like I said, it's not very often. Th th that's world class. You think about the St. Lawrence that's, River. That's you know, where you're catching fours and fives and that, and that's what it's taken to win. We have that right here. And I'm not saying that it's the easiest of fishing because you can certainly go out and get skunk. But if you have some idea of what's going on and you figure something out, it, you're on to something and you're going to have a very special, special season. Was the smallmouth fishing always this good here? Was it like they stocked like Erie strain or did it just pop off all of a sudden? So I think it kind of goes in cycles like anything else. Um, I've been tournament fishing here since 2000. Um, and it's so we had a lot of grass then and largemouth kind of dominated. And then there was like a stretch of about 10 years where smallmouth dominated. And then, then the largemouth took back over and it just kind of goes back and forth. Um, I think two years ago, the Army Corps decided to enact some law from 1974 and they sprayed um, a lot of the grass, um, it was, um, the hydrilla. So that kind of, um, tempered back the largemouth fishing and a lot of guys just turned to the smallmouth. So we have standing timber, like I said, and that seems to be, you know, you can get on some patterns out doing something like that. And, um, that seems to be what the guys are doing. You mentioned that law. Could we delve into that a little bit more? Because I, inter I interviewed the Army Corps of Engineers that run Kerr, like Bugs Island, and they have a, a zero hydrilla policy there. And I am, I'm interested, is this something that's basically all Army Corps of Engineers are in lockstep about, or is it just a couple? Yeah, there's some there's some obscure law that they quoted because the fishermen were up in arms. But, you know, we ran into there wasn't a lot that we could do to argue it or to fight against it. Um, and they, so we had quite a bit of grass. So. They, it comes from like the house boats and stuff that that beach their boat up along the shores uh, and that's where it comes from and there's a lot of nitrates to get into the lake through farms and you know this is a river and so everything kind of flushes down from a from another lake and into this one and uh, there's a lot of siltation going on this lake is starting to age starting to show age but so grass takes off and grass will hold in the shallow areas and and it really had some years of special largemouth fishing as well. But mm. right now the smallmouth are completely dominating. <laughs> no question asked. That's, that's where you go to get a big bag. Everybody knows it. And that's what everybody's doing. It really sucks when this stuff happens. Cause that's one thing on my show. I've been, I've been really champing at the bit to talk about is how important SAV is. I've had a couple of, of DWR agents that are actually pro um, SAV, like John Odenkirk down here, like you need it. Cause especially with Raystown where you don't have a lot of spawning habitat guys, if you want, if you're listening on, on Spotify, Apple, or if, if you're on YouTube, just stop Google the lake. There's not a lot of like, I would say like legit largemouth spawning habitat. 
And when you mm-hmm. cut down on the SFV like that, it just hurts it that much more, which is a damn shame. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so a lot of the spawns kind of take place right around Memorial day. And this place, that's, uh, that's kind of like where we ran into to problems because of the fish commission season for Pennsylvania. And then the army Corps saying, well, from Memorial day to, to labor day, you can't, you can't have tournaments. And that's, that was where the rub was. Um, and they weren't saying that we couldn't have tournaments, but the weigh-ins had to be past four o'clock. So if we could, because this is fresh, this just happened. Yes. Is, could we do right. a timeline on this? Cause this wasn't last year. It was, it was, it was recent, right? Um, so I want to say two Fridays ago, I came out of work and my phone was just going crazy. And Andy, the guy that I run my series with said, Hey, did you hear this? And he sent me a picture of an email sent to another tournament director and I read it, you know, and it just said, um, all special permits for special activities will be denied from Memorial day to labor day, um, from 9 AM to 4 PM. Um, you're welcome to resubmit, you know, after that time, but we're going to deny it. Um, and so that's how it started. And, of course, once word spread, guys were very, very upset. Um, it's not like the bulk of our tournaments are during that time because fishing season um, has continuously moved up from the fish commission. The fish commission keeps moving trout season up and that squeezes bass season. So we go from basically like an ice out. We have about a two week window. Everybody tries to get their spring tournament in. Um, and then we fish like Father's Day. And then like one in J- July or August and then nothing until September, you know, and that's just kind of how it is. So the big, the big problem is if you schedule a spring tournament too early and you get an ice event, now you're, now you're forced to reschedule in the middle of summer. And I, I can't even describe to you how crazy this place is. It's a hundred percent full every weekend <laughs> during the summer. Um, so it's not fit for man or beast. And we certainly don't want to be out there till 4 PM. And then, you know, you have the fish commission saying, Hey, we're worried about fish mortality. Actually in the middle of this, a biologist called and said, um, Hey, you know, be prepared. We're going to start denying permits for any time. The water is over 80 degrees. And they're really advocating for catch photo and release, which is a little problematic for us to, to manage as just a small time trail. There is so much to unpack there. <laughs> let's uh, yeah, yeah. let's go. The first thing I want to go into is like, was this like somebody emailed you like, Hey, we're, we're voting on this thing. Uh, no. I want to get involved in the process. Like how was this just kind of like Friday? No. You know, at midnight? So, no so uh, I got the same email right after uh, Andy had sent me a picture of the one sent to the other uh, tournament. And it basically read from the fish commission, Hey, we approved your permits, but the army Corps denied them and you're welcome to resubmit. Let us know what you want to do. And here's uh, the army Corps number. (laughs) So I did pursue uh, speaking with the ranger who denied it and, um, you know, try, try to understand why basically. And I couldn't really get, a straight answer. It was just, Hey, you guys are impeding the ramp traffic flow. He kind of envisioned stages and crowds. I assured him we don't have a stage or a crowd. Um, it didn't seem to matter <laughs> what I, what I was telling him. He, he had made up his mind, but he said he would go back and talk to his staff. And then, you know, the concession came out. Well, we could, we could do it as long as the weigh-in was after four. But again, so if we started, I'm in the water at 3 a.m. If we start at 5 and we catch a fish at 5.30, that fish is in my live well until after 4 p.m. There's no way uh, in the middle of the summer that I can ask a guy to try to keep his fish alive for over 12 hours. It's just it's hmm. unreasonable. Yeah, it's a very unreasonable request. So we're kind of squeezed between two government juggernauts, the Fish Commission and the army corps. Um, and then just this last Friday, we finally got a little resolution, um, a little concession that said, Hey, we'll approve your permits, but, um, you're going to be responsible for the traffic flow. 
So anybody that's been to a boat ramp knows that a bass fisherman is usually not the problem at a ramp. And that's the case here. The case, you know, the problem at the ramp is maybe the guy just got a boat. There's a lot of COVID boats now. People don't know how to operate them, load COVID them, boats. unload them. And that's what ties up the ramp. It's not the, it's not the bass fisherman. But some, of, some of these guys have been running boats for 30 years. I mean, <laughs> I, I personally launch my boat every weekend, you know, several times. So I want to make sure that we hit that on the head, though, that the way the Army Corps engineers cultivated this and displayed it to you was it's due to congestion at the boat ramp, correct? Yes, yes. That's what they ultimately settled on. And so, you know, I, not even three years ago, four years ago tops, right before COVID, there was a, they were doing redoing their master plan and they were they were trying to stick a resort on one of the peninsulas here down near the dam and, and it got a lot of resistance, but the politicians really wanted it. There was a big um, Texas billionaire that really wanted it because it tapped into his land, but you know, they didn't get it. So they were expanding the parking and the space. They had saturation studies, they had helicopters flying over counting boats. Um, and, and the Army Corps continued to expand parking during this time. And now you have an oversaturated oversatur lake that is just borderline unsafe. Um, you have boaters doing donuts out in the middle, you know, <laughs> dragging their kids on a tube. And, you, you know, you have jet skis going every which way. And it's, it's really just a, um, it's a very chaotic scene, I guess. I, th it's insane. It's... There are so many things about government laws I don't understand. Where we, we have a lake down here in Virginia called Philpot Lake. It's twenty five hundred acres. You can run a two hundred boat tournament on there if you want with a gas engine. We also have a lake in Baltimore that's nine thousand acres that you need electric motor on. I don't understand these any of these rules like of what they decide. Like you can use a, a wake boat here but not here. It, it doesn't make sense. And the fact that so many states are against lake building besides Texas. And then we're going to say, we're not going to build any more impoundments that are in need. People will use them, but then we're going to clamp down on the ones that exist. And that to me is bonkers. And the fact that they're saying, because there's a traffic issue at the boat ramp, we're going to shut down the lake. And I looked before we started recording, it's not just one boat ramp. I don't know if you're familiar with Deep Creek Lake uh, in Maryland, but that's got one boat ramp on that five, 6,000 acre lake. That's it. There's a couple here. And it's insane that they're going to still cite that as a reason to, to nail you guys and, and cancel bass fishing. It's insane. Yeah. And so in the old master plan, they had a, a site designated, they were going to build a bass tournament only facility. So it was strictly going to be our ramp and that would have worked, but they did away with that in the master plan. You know, I attended all of the master plan meetings and they, they just, said, you know, there's not a lot of interest for it. And it kind of went away. Um, whoa, whoa, hold, 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 hold. What does that mean? What does that mean? Not a lot of interest. Like no one showed yeah, up or they didn't it, invite people. Yeah. So <laughs> you have a lot of um, stakeholder groups and they all are fighting for different things. You have the guys that, that want to kayak and have a lot of no wake zones. You have the people who just want to ski. You know, you have, a, I understand that they're, they're dealing with a lot of different groups that have a lot of different interests. No, but I, at the end of the at the end of the day, I, you know, if you have a box that holds a hundred beads, and fifty on any given day, fifty of them are red, and twenty are green, and twenty are blue, and ten are yellow, why do you care what what makes up the number of beads? You only have a hundred that can fit in the box. You know what I mean? So you're trading fifty bass boots for what fifty wake boots? I, I just can't. I couldn't make sense of that. It just seemed discriminatory and kind of like blaming the tournament guy for all of their problems, all of the mismanagement of parking and, you know, whatever no, was going it, on. It definitely comes across that way. And the thing that really gets an itch in my crawl when, with everyone I've talked to over the last two years is stakeholders. It's like, who the hell are these phantom stakeholders? Let's have a meeting and the stakeholders mm -hmm. can show up. But when I show up to the meeting, you talk about, well, there's other stakeholders where are they and why do they never show up? There's always these phantom people, these phantom right. groups. They never exist in person, but they're there. And that's the most frustrating part. It's almost it's almost a cop-out answer so that they can just placate. And that's what's just so frustrating here. And what's interesting is it's not 
it's not the fish commission it's the army corps of engineers and what some someone asked me when when i kind of broke this last week was well we should protest and what we could do is like we're just not going to buy fishing licenses and get the fish commission like I don't know how that would work because like you said, you're having these two heads budding, but why wouldn't the fish commission come to the aid of the anglers here being like, listen, it kind of hurts our bottom line if we cancel fishing in Pennsylvania. Like, well, I mean, I don't know. The, the protests that I was contacted about were we, it, the way here's one of the problems. One of, one of the problems they have one ramp where they enforce the, the boat trailer parking. So you have all these boat trailer parking spots, but a Volkswagen Jetta can park in it at any other ramp except one. So in theory, one boat could launch and have 30 cars with it, and he ties up all the parking spots. If they're worried about use, which I don't think they should be, they should be worried about less users, not more. Or if they're worried, I don't know what their concern is, and I couldn't really get a feel for who may be behind this move. It doesn't seem legitimate. Did somebody complain? I couldn't get any data. They don't have any information. They can't cite any examples of how we tied up the ramp. They can't, you know, there's just nothing there. And so my primary mission when I spoke to the ranger was, is this a local decision or is this driven by Baltimore District who controls Racetown? And so it, it turned out to be a local decision. Um, so I know the guy and I know all of the rangers from church and soccer and, and it wasn't ever my intention to to demean them or to injure them in any way but you know when you make a bad choice um you kind of reap the consequences and so the consequences in this case were it was a lot of bad pub publicity for them and a lot of bad publicity about this um because it just don't feel like they understand the angler's role in who does the the conservation projects who does the lake cleanups who does you know, like who participates in this stuff it is not the boater from wherever who comes in and spends a week vacation it's your local guy who cares and, mm. and so i think they really missed the boat there and hopefully we will learn from this and move forward and you know you had mentioned that you know in maryland you have a uh, black bass commission or a a board of some yeah. sort that yeah. would be awesome it would be awesome if there was two-way communication but but that doesn't happen here there was no communication other than you can't do it and it, that's you need part a lawsuit. of the problem that's what you need i mean so virginia's big thing was i don't know if you're familiar with this like the shenandoah you know the shenandoah river had a it was basically poisoned uh by a corporation and there was a massive lawsuit that got fishermen a little bit more rights there was um there was some other litigation issues that got a black bass advisory board established in maryland and it comes down to somebody in the fishing industry suing the shit out of either the army corp or because that's the only way people like move they don't move you ask please but they move when you have a court order and I, I try to cover a lot of different groups, cat fishermen, crappie fishermen, bass fishermen. We are so tribalized and we are so hard to come together on things. We need to come together on certain issues and be like, yeah, I, I don't care if you are a striper fisherman or a largemouth. This is, this is something we need to actually in lockstep work to find an answer to. Yeah. I th Thomas, you bring up a great point. And so something I want to talk about real quick, you know, when I, when I started tournament fishing in the nineties and I'm, aging myself but bass was was a very big deal and i don't feel like the army corps would have tried this back in that time because bass would have came to our aid they would have fought and through you know the splitting of bass and and kind of splitting of groups there's been a little degradation in in the conservation area so you don't have that same power that that you used to have in the 90s you have a lot of splinter groups a lot of trails that have splintered off and done their own thing that maybe aren't even bass associated anymore um so that i mean and that's part of the issue part of the issue is some somebody from the fisherman side needs to be working with the biologist in a, in a two-way communication about what you know what what is good for everyone and what can't work um, mm -hmm. so that that, that's a very, very big thing. And I think that's something that we're going to look at um, going forward because I don't feel like this is over. I feel like this is a, a you know, a placation for 2024. Um, 
and yeah. again, and we, we have such an outstanding fishery. We just want to be able to pass it on to our sons, to the youth. Um, well, you, yeah, I mean, not we just to be want selfish. to continue what we have. Yeah, 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 and not, and not to be selfish, but it's also precedent. And that was the first thing I posted was like you might not care about this like but this is a precedent that gets set anything in law and i keep going back to that because that's how the world works ladies and gentlemen if if it passes here it'll pass somewhere else and they'll use that um you know the thing i've been i think is hilarious that i've been getting in trouble with down here is when they use the we can't have people on the lake because it's somebody's water source and it's like that's bullshit it's not that you're using that as a reason to keep people off um especially it's 2024 you can figure that out um but it's just they use some way to kick people off and what's crazy to me is i'm trying to get somebody on and if you're listening right now uh, in the wake boat industry i'm pretty sure that industry is about two billion dollars gdp whereas the bass fishing is 10 billion it's massively bigger and so the only thing i can think of is either bass like you said has completely dropped the ball because they're not like what the nra is you know for gun owners or it's because the people that own those wake boats are the lawyers and the hedge fund managers. And it's those kids that are out there. Those are the only two things I can think of as to why we're losing this fight. Well, again, Thomas, if somebody could provide a, a specific example, um, I would be happy to review it. But nobody can provide any examples. There are no examples um, of any time that any bass tournament that I've ever been in has impeded the boat room. Never. And I really mean never. If somebody is struggling with their boat, somebody will help them. We help non-bass boaters with their boats because they're tying up the ramp. Mm -hmm. So I feel like, you know, we're going to have to go to some kind of video system almost to cover ourselves, you know, to show that we're not the problem. Um, this particular ramp has a creek that comes in, has like a little dock in the middle, and then all the bass boats park up the side of the cove out of the way there's there's no way that anybody's impeding things and when the tournament is over all the bass boats park up the side of the cove everybody um bags up their fish 10 at a time so you know so that we're not standing in line with fish um they come to like a picnic table or a table that we set up with the scales and we're completely out of the way there's no way nobody can provide an example and and that's the most frustrating part we'd be willing to work with whoever I have invited the Rangers to join us, to give us pointers, to maybe make an outline of ways we could improve. And it's just their response is, well, we know when we're busy. Uh, and so that's not somebody who wants to work with me. And, and so I don't feel that if somebody can't provide me an example, then, it, you know, it's just kind of like a subjective thing and I'm not going to change their mind. So that's where it's at. And, and what's interesting and, and cause there's a couple more things I want to make sure that we, we cover too, but we'll put a bow in this. They did retract and adjust their, their decision-making. Yeah. What's so interesting. There was people that were working other angles The there was a, a, a ground game, I guess you would call it. Um, social media, which thank you, by the way, for, for helping on that end. There were people contacting politicians. There was people working their chain up through the, the Baltimore district of the Army Corps. And, and so there was multiple things going on at once. And that was very important to get this overturned because I feel like, you know, when you get in a situation like this, it can't just be two or three people. It, it needs to be a lot of voices. So we were almost to the point of starting a petition, you know, going around getting signatures and, and kind of like approaching lawmakers. We were, we were right to that, that point. Um, luckily it didn't get that bad. So hopefully we won't have to go down this road again, but for anybody that's listening, this is really important. I never in a million years thought that race town would be the first salvo of this fight. And I do believe that the bass tournament fishermen will get squeezed out or people will attempt to. And, and that's, a, that's the big takeaway here. Um, you, you had better start establishing a two-way communication with the people that make decisions. Um, that's where we've dropped the ball and that's where I want to improve. 
And I also think that, you know, you really have to really watch your ramp, whether you're videoing it with your GoPro or, or whatever, because in this day and age, like anybody can claim anything. And unless you have proof, I don't know how you defend yourself. It's how they come about it, which is what's scary to me. There, we have a lake actually in Northern Virginia. <clears throat> it's called Lake Manassas. I did, guys, I did a video on this. Um, now they spend ninety thousand dollars a year to keep people out, and it was one of the biggest lakes in Northern Virginia. And then a golf course came in, bought up all the land around it, and then so, there was an accident that happened on the lake. And they were like, "Well, for people's safety, no one's allowed on the lake. We, you know, we're afraid of the water source for for you know the Fairfax area, and we're afraid people will get hurt." So because of that, we're going to spend $90,000 a year to police it to make sure no one gets on the lake. They never say anything about fishing, but it was for your safety. And that's to me is like such a buzzword of how they do this. It's if a kid gets killed on a jet ski, all hitting a bass boat, all of a sudden for your safety, we shouldn't have people out there. It's for your safety at the boat ramp. You know, we can't have you do this. And it's, it's so it's, they always, they always word it just right. So it sounds sweet but it's very deadly and just be aware everyone out there. This is how, this is how it happens. This is how you start losing your ability to go out on a lake. Um, yeah. You, you raise a really good point. There have been deaths here and none of them have involved a bass boat to date. Luckily um, we have cliffs that people jump from and they drown and, and people try to drive this lake at night and it's a little tricky without a GPS and they run aground. There's been big, big, um, Publicly, you know, publicly understood wrecks, I guess, you know, that everybody in town was talking about and knew about, um, but none of them have ever involved a, a bass boat. Um, and so to make us nocturnal almost, almost increases that risk. I don't want to see a hundred bass boats running around at night because we can't fish in the summer. And frankly, we just want to get on the water, do our thing and be out of there by two o'clock because I don't even want to be on the lake afternoon. It's not fit to even be on. So the very few no wake zones, everybody's in there by noon getting out of the way. Anyway, I, I don't understand what the big problem was. The, the last thing I really want to touch on on this is something that we mentioned at the beginning where you talked about the Pennsylvania uh, fish commission. They're really pushing catchway release. Yes. When did yes. this start? When did this happen? I mean, I have my own thoughts on, on the whole catchway release and where that fits in the whole fishing world, but mm -hmm. the idea like it's being pushed so heavily, like, could you talk about that a little bit? Yeah. So I don't know the biologist by name, um, but I know that he's weighing heavily and he's concerned about mortality from, so in the other trail, there is a fishery biologist, um, degree and he runs his trail. And, you know, we've talked about this, that some mortality is going to happen regardless. And some mortality is okay. Now, you don't want to, you know, kill hundreds of bass. But, but if some of the smaller fish die, you know, it is what it is. It's not any different than if 100 guys went out just angling for fun and they kept them all. You know, it's not. You have striper guides who... who drag live bait and catch gigantic smallmouth all day long and their clients take them home. You know, fish, fish live and they die. And that's, that's part of the cycle. And that said, you know, you got to understand this lake has a thermocline. So if you've killed all the grass and so the only place to catch a fish now is 20 feet deep or deeper, the water temperature may be 85, but at 20 feet deep, that water's 39 degrees. And so they've done, different television shows about Racetown Ray and they had divers go down. And I I've personally put a camera, an awkward view camera with the temperature gauge. That water is 39 degrees from about 22 feet to 200 feet. It never changes. So if the fish all go to 39 degrees because of boat traffic, because you killed the weeds, because you took away all structure because of, the, of siltation, how is it the fault of the fishermen? You know, that's where he has to go to, to be successful. So some, oh. some mortality is going to happen. And, and we understand that. We, we fizz our fish. You know, people put ice in there. These guys aren't trying to, to impact, you know, the ecology in any negative way at all. If anything, the, the bass tournament fisherman cares more about his resource than anyone. Um, and, and, 
so again, it's just a misunderstanding of what we do. Um, they don't seem willing to try to understand it. They just have their viewpoints and it's like, I don't know how to get through to you that we, we aren't the bad guys. Um, but that's, <laughs> that's just kind of where they've taken their stand. For, for people that are listening right now that are not Pennsylvania natives, how long is this, I guess, moratorium every year on being able to put fish in the live well? So trout season in 2024, trout season uh, begins sometime in the beginning of April. Our last tournament scheduled is, I believe, April 7th. Mm. But I can, re- I can remember when I started fishing April 19th, April 20th, you know, well into April. And if I had one request of the fish commission, it would be like, go back to the, to the dates of old. So it's like, it's almost like they're basing all of their decisions on license sales and trout sells more. And there's a lot of money allocated for that. And so that becomes the premier fish. And why do you, you think know, they, that is? Like, I, don't, I, don't I don't know. I don't know. I, I, I deal I with this understand. in Maryland, you know, with the, the black bass board and, from a capitalist standpoint, I guess it makes sense because you have to buy a trout stamp, right? So they put more money in. So is there a way we could make bass fishing profitable for the state? Or what could we do to be like this? Make I get why maybe this is you think this makes you money. But there is a shit ton of people that also like to chase, you know, the brown ones and the green ones. And we would like to give you money. So is, is there some kind of solution that we could do? I think most guys would, you know, we used to have a ramp pass that you bought an annual pass where you could just pay the $5 for the day. I would like to see that come back there. The ramps mm. are really getting torn up. We have, I have actually seen a decommissioned uh, Navy PT boat on this lake, uh, extracted by an 18 wheeler with an oversized load sign. To me, that is ridiculous. That is absolutely ridiculous to be running, you know, a Navy boat on this lake. I've seen a yellow submarine in this lake, like literally go underwater and do its sub thing. <laughs> it, it's just insane to me what people will put in here, but somehow, you know, the ramps get tore up. Um, they don't want to take care of them. You can't get a pothole filled. You can't get a light bulb fixed. Like you can't get the grass mood. Like I, I, that's fine. I don't think the average guy would have a problem paying a little more for, for a good, um, facility. And they stock as far as the fish commission, they stock hundreds of thousands of walleye, hundreds of thousands of musky, hundreds of thousands of lake trout. The striper club, um, raises and stocks their own stripers. Um, so where's, where is the bass guy to go? You know, there's nobody within the fish commission that I can tell. That's, you know, fighting for the black bass. It, it's not a problem we're going to solve today, but I, I'm definitely thinking about how I, we can do things different, at least in Maryland and Virginia, too. To There's a problem in the system, and it's easy, I guess, to say that there's a problem because it's like no shit. <laughs> but it's yeah. trying to figure out a solution that everyone would buy into. But something has to get done here to, to kind of help support the bass. And I also blame bass, B-A-S-S. I do. I, I think they should kind of be like the NRA for, you know, yeah, bass the days of, you Thomas, you remember, I'm sure you're old enough yeah. to know the days of old, man. B-A-S-S was something. It meant something. And everybody had that sticker and people knew you don't mess with them because bass had an actual conservation director that was you know in touch with people in the state and you know when the split happened and i understand different tours have developed out of it and i understand that it's about money but that part of it has gotten dropped and you know when i was young i didn't understand well man i don't want to do this conservation project but now that i'm older i kind of i you know you mature you kind of understand hey this is a resource this is something i would like this kid to be able to experience you know, I'm not keeping this bass. I'm turning it loose so somebody else can catch it and enjoy it. And that, and that's a maturation process for the fishermen. But it's like the state. I don't know if the stock if a stocking program is the answer. I'm not sure. Um, I think each lake is so unique. It's hard to make a you know a blank. Race town is loaded with bait. There is so much bait here. It's insane. Like I can't even describe to people the balls of bait here. Uh, there are millions, 
no exaggeration of alawives. Hmm. And it's evident at night. If you come here in like right around July 4th, walk anywhere near the water, you can hear these alawives spawning all night long, you know, so there's plenty of bait and plenty of fish uh, in this lake. It's not hurting whatsoever. On a positive note, was it forward facing sonar that really busted this place open? Cause I remember old Bassmaster magazines. They talked about L wife lakes being hard as hell because those fish would suspend. And then along came Garmin. Is that when you saw the bag start really going like through the roof? I, I, I would say yes. Uh, it was very clear. Um, probably 2021 20, who had uh, forward facing sonar and who didn't. So mm. those guys catapulted and stayed in the top. I'm not saying that it's the end all be all. It's a tool like anything else, you know, but me personally, oh, I, yeah. I probably catch two or three of my fish or call two or three of my fish because of uh, live scope. Um, this past year, we're starting to see like some of the effects of pressure where you have to sit further away from them, where you don't see it. Uh, we have, a, you know, a couple thousand laydowns in this lake and there's no fish in them because they're picked apart you know so you're starting to see some fishing pressure affect it um you know i would describe my my best pattern for 2023 is the hope and pray you know like <laughs> we're just going to go down this bank because it looks bad you know it, and nobody, yeah nobody's yeah. bothering it so and it gets to habitat too and this is why you know, SAV, if, if you guys don't, the guys that are listening don't like live scope, then fall in love with SAV. Cause if you have a healthy hydrilla or milfoil population in your lake, you know, that really swings the pendulum back to a guy that doesn't have it. And it also gives you that healthy largemouth population. But if you have Zippo of any kind of grass, those fish are going to suspend because there's only so many sticks and logs in the damn place. I mean, that's just, you know, common sense. Um, right. It, it's, we've always, we've, we've always posited that the uh the standing timber would play you just had no real way of knowing where you were in or what it looked like um hang on one second so the standing timber has kind of come into its own uh, and like anything else i believe it's probably just a trend but we'll see um if the grass comes back you know everything could tip or, you know, and the fishery goes through changes. The smallmouth are dominant now. They're five pounds. That's a very old fish. Jesus. So That's we'll see what kind mouth. of spawns we have. What's your biggest? What's your PR? I'm sorry. My, uh, hold on one second. I lost my, uh, lost my audio. Can you hear me? Yep, I can hear you. All right, I'm having a hard time hearing you for some reason. Let me crank that bad boy up a little bit more. Can you hear me now? No, I'm not, I'm not hearing you. You got to figure out a way to turn this up. Mm -hmm. I can barely hear you. Oh, How about now? Right. Can you hear me? Yep, I can hear you. You sound good. Okay. I, I just can't hear you barely, but that's okay. We're almost done. And we'll cut that right there. Perfect. Uh, yep. So last thing that I want to talk about is just what is your PR out of the lake? And then really just about the elites and how they can find you. So we have a we have a website. It's a crudely run website because we're not programmers or anything. It's racetownelitseries.com. We also have a Facebook page, um, Racetown Elite Series. Uh, I want to plug just another club. Um, Standing Stone Bassmasters runs uh, what's called an RBBC. Um, so that's a buddy tournament, and they were just equally um, diligent in working with us to you know to make the contacts and do all the groundwork with us. So. And then, guys, as always, link in the episode description, everything that we talked about. Um, also, if people want to actually support the, your initiative, who do they reach out to specifically if they want? Is there a petition people can sign? How can people support the fight? So 
I think we'll put a petition up on our Facebook page. Um, that's probably the best way to get in touch with us. Uh, you know, you can send through messenger or I can post it on the page and then link it, link to it. Um, but we haven't put anything up yet. We kind of been talking about where we want to go next and, and then these podcasts kind of took off. So we're not quite there yet, but I think probably in the next week or two, we'll have something put together where people can click a link and let their voices be heard. Awesome. And then, you know, guys, again, link in the episode description, everything we talked about today, Ashley, thank you so much for coming out here and just, you know, talking to me tonight. The last thing I, w- I really want to hit you on is what is your PR small mouth that you've caught out of Raystown? My PR, uh, it's not that big, but I've seen, uh, six, eight, um, come into the scales. Um, and that's, that's kind of standard. I know there's Could an some eight, eight pounder. Yeah. I was going to say that. I, I know there's going to be an eight pounder. It's only a matter of time. I know guys who have caught them, just not in the tournament. Dear God. What is the PA state record? 10 pounds? Uh, I believe it's out of Lake, Lake Erie. I think it was just caught. That, that, an eight pound smallmouth. I can't even fathom what that looks like. Jesus. Dude. Yeah. And again, you're, you're, so like striper, striper have been well known for a while. I think the, the state record striper is like 53 pounds. So we have a, we have a healthy fishery. We have a lot of bait. It's, um, it's well supported. It supports a lot of different fish. You can do just about anything you want. Um, from crappy to perch to walleye to the lake trout. Uh, it's all here. Hmm. Guys, you know, again, please follow them. It really, it really would help them because this is, this might come to your like at some point too. So for more information, you know, you can contact them in the episode description. You can contact me, uh, link in the episode description again to everything we talked about. And we'll see you guys next time on Fishing the DMV. Bye. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will.